Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filters. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. States like New Jersey, California, Connecticut, New York, and some others are working to mandate climate change curricula in every subject of K-12 through education. That would include phys ed, art, foreign languages, for heaven's sake. Nicholas Giordano is with us. What is it? They, they want to mandate this. This is the law. It's legislated. You've got to do this. Is that true? That's correct. And we're talking every subject, as you just stated. If it was science class, it would be one thing. But this is every subject. And you look at the language in the new standards, particularly New Jersey, who's spearheading this effort. Yeah. And they say that climate change must be approached from a climate justice perspective in each lesson. Must be? Must be. Wow. And think about it this way. Students teaching social studies and physical education and foreign languages, they weren't trained in climate change science, but now they're forced to teach it. And so it shows that it's about indoctrination and activism. I mean, you just brought sure. up the proficiency rating for reading. Yeah. History is at 13 percent. American civics, 22 percent. Math, 23 percent. We have dropped in the worldwide rankings, the PISA rankings. And instead of sounding the alarm bells on the learning loss and coming up with a plan to tackle that, they're introducing and legislating that climate change be introduced into every lesson from kindergarten all the way to well, high school graduation. How, how do you introduce that to phys ed, for example, or foreign yeah. languages or art history? Well, I could tell you so. When it comes to physical education, yeah. we see that climate change is now mentioned four times in the standards. Healthy eating habits are only mentioned twice. The obesity epidemic is not mentioned once. In a, a subject like social studies, and this is where you see the activism, students must create advocacy policies uh, related to climate change. Well, why advocacy? Why not discuss the issues of climate change? And it's designed to get students to look at government as the solution. I mean, I, my semester starts in a week. 90% of my students can't differentiate between the United States Constitution and Russian Constitution. 86% can't pass a basic citizenship exam. Maybe we should prioritize that over teachers that don't have any experience in climate change pushing an agenda on the student body. Now, you're a professor at a, not a high political school. Science, a, political college. science. Political science at a, a, a college. Correct. And so you must teach this in this way. Well, no, this is K through 12. Right. Okay. So when they get to okay. my class, they're going to be so focused in K through 12 on climate change, yeah. they're really not going to have any understanding of American government. But that's kind of the point. That if you don't understand the government and the powers of government, you're willing to give unlimited power. Yeah. And that's why at Campus Reform, we're sending the alarm bells, because academic excellence, intellectual curiosity, education, it's going out the window. And it's being replaced by this groupthink mentality where you're forced to think one way. Only one narrative is right. And if we give everyone a uniformity of ideas, well, then you achieve a political agenda. Go ahead. Well, at the, at the younger level, you know, uh, kindergarten, first, second grade, the yep. kids do what they're told for the most part, sure. right? The teacher is God, what they say is true. I can tell you when, when it's um, Earth Week in, in our school, my kids come home, every, we're recycling this, mom, you're using too much water. I'm fine with that, but they absorb everything that they're told. It's the, so if we're starting the, on that small level, they're gonna be listening all the way up and indoctrinated. It is an active indoctrination appeal to children. Correct. Get them as young as you possibly can, and they'll stick with you all the way through. Are we creating a, an entire generation of climate activists? Yes, we are. We've we're, already we're, created them. We are creating them, and, and it's being reinforced. But my concern is that it's based on fear. I mean, we're already seeing poll numbers that kids between the ages of 13 and 17, the majority of them have a fear of climate change. And you have them angry and feeling guilty that they're responsible for it. Yeah. When you look at polls for 18 to 24-year-olds, one-third of them are reconsidering having children. And over 60 percent, again, are angry about climate change. So we're already seeing the real-world impacts before this actually goes live in more states. Right now, New Jersey is the one that led the way. You see California, Connecticut, New York following suit. Uh, but it really shows you what the future is like. That's frightening, quite frankly. <laughs> Nicholas Giordano, I'm so glad you're here to tell us all about it. We do appreciate that. Come Thank back you for soon. Me. Thanks a lot.
PAS Report listeners, our government is out of control. Criminal tax hikes, hyperinflation, a full-blown recession, it's part of a grand plan. The billions of dollars Biden keeps sending to the corrupt government in Ukraine, the trillions in new taxes he wants to shove down your throat, the electronic banking system crash that resets everyone to zero, checking accounts, saving accounts, 401ks, IRAs, all of it, zero. But you don't have to be a victim. Protect your money and get up to $10,000 in free silver to do it when you call Gold Co. Gold Co's helped protect over $2 billion in gold and silver for people like you and me. They're offering you up to $10,000 in bonus silver when opening a qualified IRA account just for being a supporter of the PAS report. So whether you want to protect 50 grand or a half million or more, this is your opportunity to protect yourself from our out of control government. Don't be a victim and call Gold Code today. 855-656-0196. 855-656-0196. Or go to goldcode.com slash PAS report. Welcome back, everybody. Happy Monday to you all. Uh, Late last week, in the midst of all the political chaos, I was catching up on some reading and came across our next guest's latest article titled, The Ruling Class's Two-Tier Justice System Will Drive Ordinary People to Radicalization. And I couldn't agree more with that. The author of that article and a political science professor at Suffolk Community College joins us now to discuss his latest, Nicholas Giordano. Welcome back to the show. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Always appreciate it. So I have to admit, when I first started reading this, I saw mentions of Timothy McVeigh and Ruby Ridge and Waco, and I thought, ooh, that's scary. But then when I thought about the societal issues that led up to that, distrust in the government, a divided citizenry, economic strife, social strife, we're kind of in the midst of that right now. And that's really concerning. And that was one of the things that you talked about in your piece. Can you expound on that? Absolutely. And it's a lot of it has to do with people's legitimate grievances that aren't even acknowledged. So when you look at radicalization, a background in Homeland Security and emergency management, understand what radicalizes people. You go back to the 90s, you saw jobs being shifted overseas and, and then officials saying, those jobs are gone. You have to get over it. There was no empathy or anything towards people that lost their whole livelihoods. And then you fast forward to 2016 and, and you see the FBI targeting a, a presidential campaign and then a president of the United States. Many people supported the president, nearly half the country, and he was unfairly targeted. Then you have the coronavirus. And, and we all saw what happened with coronavirus. You had lockdowns, mass mandates, vaccine mandates. And when people pushed back, they were ostracized. I mean, you had over a thousand public health officials tell anyone that protested mass mandates or lockdowns that they were supporting white supremacy and pushing white supremacist ideology. The vaccines, get the vaccine or you're going to lose your livelihood. You're going to get fired. A president of the United States saying our patience is wearing thin. Now, it turned out that the officials were wrong on a lot of the accounts when it comes to the coronavirus response. Never once did they come out and apologize and say, we were wrong, we're we're never gonna let this happen again. Instead, they double, they triple down, and and they just disregard it. They try to rewrite history. You look at the school boards and parents complaining about what their children are learning, and you have the Department of Justice targeting those parents as if they're domestic terrorists, that they're gonna launch investigations. So you really see this evolution where they're pushing people as almost as if they're the enemy. And if you question the 2020 election, well, that's a taboo subject. You're not allowed to question 51 intelligence officials saying that the Hunter Biden laptop is disinformation when it wasn't. You're not allowed to question the over $400 million of Zuckerberg's money going in to take over local election operations. You can't question the changing. Uh, We changed the entire way we vote. And we can't question that, even though a government can't fix a pothole right, they seamlessly pulled off this election. It's truly stunning. So if you keep pushing people and telling them that they're crazy, they're conspiracy theorists, they're domestic terrorists, domestic enemies, which is much of the language we're using, well, then you're going to push people towards radicalization. And that brings us to the national strategy of countering uh, domestic terrorism, where the Biden administration has declared that anyone that expresses anti-government or anti-authority sentiment can incite and be labeled as a domestic terrorist. So you're not even allowed to criticize government, essentially, or else you're going to face targeting. So the government is pushing us into a very dangerous position, and it's clear we see the double standards that exist, this two-tier system about how if you think one way and you have what they deem as the right ideology and narrative, well, the system will take care of you. If you think an opposite way, the system will target you. 
That's what people see from the outside. And no one in the government is acknowledging this. And my fear is there are some that actually want something to happen because then it justifies. See, we told you the threat of domestic terrorism was high. We told you these people are radicals and extremists, yet they're the ones that are creating it. I want to ask a little bit about Joe Biden's performance. Um, he's asked about the worst fire in a century in American history. And he says, no comment, stays at the beach, doesn't go back to work. Uh, obviously never had any real engagement with the families who lost 13 soldiers in the failed withdrawal, withdrawal from Afghanistan, doesn't acknowledge even his own grandchildren for a grandchild for a long time. Uh, is uh, uh, middle-class Joe becoming callous Joe and are Americans beginning to see a man different than what they thought they voted for? Yes, I, I do believe people thought that they were electing someone who is empathetic, who understood them, but, but more importantly, would unite the country. And obviously, uh, we got the exact opposite of that. He's been one of the most divisive presidents in the history of the United States, even pushing so far as to declare nearly half the country as the most dangerous threat since our founding. So it's a problem. I mean, when you look at Hawaii and the no comment, that's the heck of the brownie mo moment. Um, and the Katrina moment that he had. When you look at how he simply dismisses the 13 soldiers that lost their lives during the Afghanistan withdrawal, again, it shows his lack of empathy. They still say that it was a flawless operation, even though the withdrawal was a disaster and significantly hurt us in the international community, significantly weakened us in the international community. And you look at this, you know, oh, it's just old Joe being Joe. Not anymore. He is someone that has always been nasty if you actually listen to how he spoke and his rhetoric when he accused Republicans of wanting to put black people back in chains. But I think he can't control it anymore and his true colors are coming out. I, I want to, uh, I guess, touch base with you because I always like to ask you about your students and the way that they feel about current politics and especially with respect to young voters because a lot of the reasons that they voted for Joe Biden, two that I can think of offhand, the student loan forgiveness and climate. We just covered a poll last week that a majority of Americans disapprove of his handling of climate change, which was supposed to be their one of their crowning glories. Um, as far as young people, your students, the people, the young people that you interact with, what 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 would you gauge their approval to be of President Biden across the board? Well, we see the approval numbers amongst the younger generation. Gen Z have a very low approval of President Biden, and it partly because President Biden lied to them. I mean, basically, President Biden said, we're going to forgive your student debt. And that drew in a lot of young support. Now, the, the Supreme Court overruled President Biden's uh, debt forgiveness program. But Biden himself, President Biden, understood that it was going to be overruled. I mean, uh, this is a guy in an administration that went through with the mortgage uh, eviction moratorium, even though they knew it was going to be overturned, he openly stated he didn't care. He was still going to push it forward. So the, the student debt thing was an election ploy in 2022, and it did work in some areas, right? We saw youth turnout significantly increase. I don't think it's going to work twice, though, and that's why I think he's in trouble. Uh, I think you're right. And a lot of people saw that student loan thing as a as a part of his campaign as almost a mini bribe. It's like it's right in the wheelhouse or something. Nicholas, as always, we greatly appreciate it. your time. To, uh, I know. Everybody go check out his podcast, The PAS Report. It is excellent. You will learn so much. John and I have a lot to discuss after these commercials, so stick around and we'll be right back. PAS Report listeners, hurricane season is almost here and the time to prepare is right now, not when the hurricane hits. When Hurricane Ida hit the Gulf Coast, it destroyed countless homes and left many without access to food and clean water. Millions lost power, some for weeks. The floods that followed the hurricane washed out roads, made it impossible for grocery stores to restock their shelves. Families were desperate. They were waiting for help that was slow to arrive. But what if you didn't have to rely on FEMA to provide for your family during a crisis? The answer is simple. Be prepared with emergency food kits from 4Patriots. They're long-lasting and delicious food options are specifically designed to provide you and your loved ones with the sustenance you need when you need it most. And these food kits are hand-packed in the USA, last up to 25 years, compact inside covert storage totes, include a wide variety of delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and they're backed by thousands of five-star customer reviews. For Patriots, survival food is not just for natural disasters. In today's world of uncertain supply chains and unpredictable emergencies, it's more important than ever to have a backup plan. Whether it's temporary power outage, a winter blizzard, rising food costs, you can rest easy knowing that you have a 
reliable source of food to see you through. And right now, you go to 4 use code PAS to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including the emergency food supply kits that are designed to last up to 25 years. Just go to 4 use code PAS to get 10% off your first purchase of 4 Patriots Survival Food. And uh, let's see. So what? Uh, 15 more as well. Welcome aboard, everybody. It's five minutes past the hour of 10 p.m. here on Tuesday. Good to be back. And uh, you know what day and time it is wherever you are listening to the Steve Malzberg show. Just uh, a mess. But we're going to catch you up on everything. That, of course, was the uh, district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia, Fannie Willis, announcing last night, really at a, at a bizarre time, um, just about, well, it was, it was after midnight that she made that announcement. So it was actually earlier today, if uh, technically speaking. Anyway, um, just just crazy stuff uh, here to sort it all out. We welcome back our friend um, Nicholas Giordano, professor of political science, host of the PAS Report podcast, um, political analyst. Uh, professor, welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me, Steve. Crazy times oh. we're living through. Yeah, t- crazy, but, you know, also dangerous. So so let's let's talk about this one before we put it in context and 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 figure out how what, what life is going to look like for Donald Trump and for all of us going forward. Um, so many crazy things about this, uh, this indictment uh, before we talk about the timing and the premature posting of the indictment and the excuse and the whole thing. Let, let, let's look at what is being charged here. I mean, we have. This is under the RICO statutes, a conspiracy under RICO to overturn the election results in the state of Georgia. So everything like texts and meetings and phone calls and, and Trump saying, I, I won the election uh, or, you know, or, or I didn't lose the election, whatever they put in the that that's all cited. or each one of those. All those things are cited as violations of the law. In addition to the list, if I let it go on, you heard Rudy Giuliani, you heard Mark Meadows, the chief of staff uh, of uh, Donald Trump, but attorney after attorney after attorney for daring to participate in the in the in the talks, in the effort to 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 get Trump what they felt was justice for Trump under the law. They're lawyers. They felt that this was what what he could do. How is all this possible? Well, when you use the RICO statutes, it's usually used for organized crime. It's almost as if President Trump or former President Trump is the big guy and he's sending all his underlings around the world to collect money for him. But that's not the case. This is all about tweets that he sent out, text messages. You know, Mark Meadows sent a text message asking for someone's phone number. You have emails. And really, when you look at what they're using as evidence to back up the indictment, It's actually shameful when you look at it. I mean, in in one of the tweets, President Trump stated that Georgia election hearings were on OAN, and she put that in there as evidence. In another claim, President Trump put out a tweet stating that the the counting in Fulton County, the counting of ballots stopped and everyone was sent home. And they're saying that that is false information, that the the president was providing false information. But yet that actually happened. Every single network reported that everything stopped in Fulton County and the election workers were sent home. Right. So we we didn't find out till the next day or whenever, but we didn't find out that night about Georgia. Correct. And and it's almost as if we're in the twilight zone where you see things that actually happened are, are now being used to say that they were providing false information to further a conspiracy to defraud the United States somehow. It doesn't make any sense. And the targeting of lawyers is something that is very fearful, because if you look at someone like the former president, he's had several lawyers that attorney client privilege was thrown out the window. They they seized the records, whether it's Michael Cohen, whether it was Rudy Giuliani, uh, uh, Newland and, and several others. And you look at it and basically I think it's a message to anyone that's representing Trump that, hey, you may want to think twice before you pick him up as a client because you're going to be a target as well. And how many lawyers passed on taking Trump's cases because they didn't want to get involved in the cesspool that's going on. So it is concerning. Yeah. Yeah. And and Eastman, too. I mean, I don't know if you mentioned him and it got by me, but Eastman, I mean, well respected. My God. I mean, uh, you know, and his his attorney. Uh, when he was first named in the uh, in the the other 
uh, indictment by Jack Smith said that, you know, he believed that as a as a as a lawyer, that he believed that it was legal. That everything we're do they were doing was legal and that he had a, a path to, to 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 overturn the election or fight for whatever it was. I, I mean, but not only is it not only will it prohibit people from representing Donald Trump, but professor, I mean, my God, uh, and I, I know you realize this, but I mean, it, it, if a, if attorney client privilege is now fair game, if if a Supreme Court would ever uphold this when eventually it gets to them, uh, then then how what how do lawyers work? I mean, how, how do you how do you confide in a lawyer? Yeah, I mean, well, how do you and if two lawyers are telling you one thing and the other one's telling you the other, you better pick the right one or you're all going to jail. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Well, this is in America. I mean, we have to understand that we are in a new America. This is not the America that I grew up in. It's not the America that that I know and love. It's a changed America where everything is highly political, where everything is becoming weaponized, where you are now targeting speech and thought for crimes because you don't like what this speech is all about. I mean, let's look at this logically. This is an attack. There is nothing in the Constitution, there is nothing in the penal code that says that you can't question or challenge an election. There is nothing that says it may not be right, but there's nothing that says even if you know you lost the election that you can't question the election. That's not a crime. And yet that's exactly what they're doing. They're criminalizing any type of questions. But it only goes to one narrative, right? Because if we look at Democrats over the last 20 years, they question 2000, 2004, they question 2016, Stacey Abrams questioned 2020 in, in her gubernatorial race. You have Hillary Clinton that wrote, what, a 600 page book on why she lost, blaming everyone, everything from James Comey to the Russians to Macedonian content farmers. Right, but now right. we have a new standard in this new America where if the powers that be determine that you are illegally questioning an election, well, then they could prosecute you and they're going to use your tweets, which are publicly available information. It's not like, you know, when they say conspiracy to defraud government, most people are probably thinking like everything's taking place in the shadows. But no, these tweets were public information. It's not like President Trump was trying to hide anything. And that's the amazing part that this was all publicly available information, yet two and a half years later, right before the kickoff of the 2024 presidential campaign in the primary season, well, now they're dropping all these indictments. It seems a little too coordinated, a little too convenient. There's definitely coordination going on between the feds and the state. And at what point are people going to say enough is enough? You may not like the former president. There, there are people that don't like him. I understand that. I get that. But when you see the system being weaponized to this degree, it, it is frightening, it is dangerous, and it's leading us down a very dark path. Because if you are going to indict a former president of the United States, you better for damn sure ha have the exact crimes and the evidence to show that those crimes are committed, leave it nothing up to the imagination, leave nothing up to interpretation. And that's not what they're doing here. Almost in all these cases, all four indictments, they're doing legal jujitsu. They're using untested, unproven legal theories to take down a former president and a current presidential candidate, the front runner for the Republicans. They're using untested legal theories. And that, to me, says everything you need to know. If they had any real evidence, that smoking gun evidence of any type of real manipulation, that would be in this indictment. But it's not. It's all about the tweets and the statements being made and asking for someone's phone number and saying that, hey, in Pennsylvania, they're holding a hearing. And that's what it's all about. So it really is astonishing. And then when you have people that teach constitutional law come out and say that these are strong cases, it makes me wonder, why are they even teaching constitutional law? Because they don't deserve to be in a classroom when well, you have yeah. politicians yeah. pushing this crap. You know, they don't realize how easily this could be turned on them. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Well, when you, when you talk about, you know, law school and even medical school and everything else, it's 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 overrun. Everything is overrun by the left. These are people who have been in schools for years and, and, and they've, they're in positions now where they they are, you know, bringing forth the next generation and they're going to be harder left than ever. 
And that's that's a whole nother issue. And that's very, very, very scary. Uh, and we're talking to a Professor Nicholas Giordano here on the Steve Malsberg show. OK, so, <laughs> you know, overreach, as you, you've just laid out beautifully, uh, the overreach here, the taking a RICO statute that 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 is designed to get organized cr- crime criminals and 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 here they're going after, as you just laid out the case that they're going after. Uh, and the same thing with Jack Smith, um, you know, overreaching, extending uh, uh, using laws, one after that was after the Civil War and used against the KKK and using it against Donald Trump, et cetera. And he's been he's been slapped down by the U.S. Supreme Court eight to nothing in his case against a former Republican Virginia governor in 2016 when he convicted him. Uh, the court overturned him eight nothing on overreach. So but so what do you think? I mean, this is going to be a Fulton County jury filled with, again, Democrat voters, people who probably despise Donald Trump as much as the prosecutor has made clear and as much as the who knows about the judge. He's been on the bench six months, whatever, in this position. But it, can you convince people that uh, of what you just said? I mean, that this is just crazy. Well, that's going to be the difficult thing. I mean, you know, I guess the Fulton County prosecutor, Fanny uh, Willis, is making it so complicated and throwing so much against the wall that she's hoping something sticks in the court of law. But one of the things I mean, when you look at how Trump is being treated under RICO and then you look at President Biden and his family, like the RICO statutes actually apply to him. Right. We have nine, ten shell companies. We have the entire Biden family getting paid, including grandchildren. We have millions of million upon millions of dollars changing hands from foreign entities. I mean, there you have evidence. We have IRS whistleblowers, FBI whistleblowers. We have bank records. We have Hunter Biden's own emails and text messages speaking to a Chinese energy firm saying that his father's right next to him. And if he doesn't get that money, there's going to be a big problem. We have Biden on camera stating that Ukraine didn't they wouldn't get the billion dollars if the prosecutor prosecutor is not fired. And yet he was fired. So we have all this evidence on Biden where it is like an organized crime family and nothing. And yet when it comes to Trump, they just despise him so much. And Steve, I hate to break this, this to you and the audience out there. But it doesn't matter if Trump is found guilty or not guilty. It's actually irrelevant at this point. The damage that has been done to this country is something that I'm not sure that we could pull back from the brink. I think that they pushed it way too far. And the reality is, if Trump is found guilty, is there going to be a single Trump supporter that's going to sit there and say that he got a fair shake? If Trump is found not guilty... Do you think that the left and the Democrats and the government is going to stop their targeting of President Trump? Because ultimately, they're on a seek and destroy mission. That's why we have the shock and awe campaign of indictments. It's seek and destroy, not just to destroy Trump, but to destroy and demoralize any of his supporters as well. Uh, But they they are taking us down a dark path. and, And I don't know how we come back from that until we actually have people. And I'm talking about not just bureaucrats. I'm talking about statesmen that actually step up and call this nonsense out. Well, th- th- you would love to see that, wouldn't you? But uh, that would take uh, that would take a lot. Unfortunately, that's asking a lot, unfortunately, even from Republicans. All right. So let's let's figure this out for a second. I mean, I don't have the exact dates. I don't have a chart in front of me like the TV puts up. But and I was tempted to copy it. But whatever. We're talking about <laughs> four. No, we're talking about four trials we're talking about trials of the, the stuff that will start in october and go jan the next one january and then um and then march and then may and then why well, i mean it's it, it, it there this is this is insanity what i mean what steps do they have i mean could could they go and i know mark levin has talked about this that possibly you know you could go to the supreme court somehow and and try to uh, intervene in one or more of these cases including this one i think before it actually gets off the ground but I mean, how on earth they, they, they're, they're, this is this is what is striking, Professor. They're so unafraid. They're so full of themselves. They're so confident. They're so pompous. They're so arrogant. And they're so, like I said, unconcerned about any repercussions that they're doing this in, in plain sight. They're going to tie up the 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 the, the, uh, the Republican presidential nominee in all likelihood the whole year. Leading up to the election, I mean, the whole, the, the whole year leading right up to the election, not not just leading up to, uh, you know, uh, near it, but right up to it. And they don't care. 
Well, why would they? I mean, nobody's been held accountable over the last 15 years within our government for any type of wrongdoing. And so I think that's why they're so brazen. And they are doing this right out in the open. Listen, running for president is difficult for one person. A criminal trial is difficult for one person to handle. Running for president and four criminal trial, uh, trials, that, that how Trump does this, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But their plan is working, right? Because they're going to be tying him up. It's going to cost him a fortune in lawyer fees. So the donations he's getting into the campaign is have going to, to go have to, to that. be spent on the legal defense. Yeah. They know that. And yeah. that's part of the reason that they do this. And it's also part of their safety net, right? So let's just say President Trump is the Republican nominee, which looks like that's the case if the election were held today. Let's say President Trump wins a second term in 2024. Well, right from the get go, he's going to be tied up with all these types of criminal cases. And of course, it's going to be an albatross around his neck. And don't you think that that's kind of a message to the voters right now? Hey, if you elect this guy, that this is what it's going to be like for the next under his term. It's going to be even worse than it was the first term. We are going to try even harder to take him down. Don't you think that that may be a message that's being relayed to the voters out there? to say you might not want to support this guy. Again, I think it's a full-on effort to try and destroy him, but not only destroy him, destroy all the people that they have zero regard for, that they look at as just the peasant class, that that they made a terrible decision in 2016, and since there's self-anointed guardians of democracy, they must correct the American people's mistake. Well, that you that you that is a perfect lead in to uh, the piece that you wrote uh, that appeared at, at the Federalist uh, back on August 10th. And that was before this uh, latest indictment, although it was anticipated. And the, the uh, title is the ruling classes two tier system will drive ordinary people to radicalization. You know, this is something that in, in, in that the the uh, left has is warned against, has prayed for, uh, maybe even has tried to instigate. Um, certainly they're, they, they look for it every chance they get. I mean, if a shooter turns out to be a, a, a Black Lives Matter supporter, the story disappears. If the shooter is white and has any chance of being a Trump supporter, they're they're all in. So so they're we looking. We still don't have the Nashville shooters manifesto, right? The trans no, shooters we manifesto. Do not. We still and you do not have that. You know how many times I've read that it's coming? Yeah, it's coming. All right. Um, so so you write about and, you know, God forbid. And it's funny, my son just uh Recently uh, took a tour to the uh, the the museum uh, at, at, or the memorial, whatever, at uh, at uh, the, the the moral building in, in Oklahoma City. You say that uh, they are wittingly uh, or unwittingly uh, nurturing the seeds of another Timothy McVeigh uh, as they continue to target their political opponents. They are crafting the playbook for the very forces they claim to counter. And that is so true. It is true. If you look at everything they've done, they are cultivating the next Timothy McVeigh right now. It's very easy to see. I mean, I was in emergency management and Homeland Security. I've done threat assessments. I understand what leads people towards extremism. And when you look at it, when people feel disillusioned, when they feel like their grievances aren't being heard, and I'm talking about legitimate grievances, when, when they feel hopeless and that the system's against them, they, they begin to go into the dark corners that we never want to be. And if you look at it, it it started when people lost their jobs and jobs were shipped overseas. You had all the politicians come out and say, get over it. They didn't show any empathy. They said, get over it. Those jobs are never coming back. Then you look at what they did with Trump, Russia, and that whole farce of an investigation. And what happened? Well, no one was held accountable. Comey got a $2 million book deal. You had Brennan and Clapper. They got nice pundit jobs, high-paying jobs on CNN and MSNBC. You look at the coronavirus, where the government came out and dictated to people, stay in your homes, wear your mask, keep the kids out of school. And if you questioned it, you were labeled as a, a science denier. You were threatened with vaccines, either get the vaccine or lose your livelihood. And many people did lose their livelihood. They chose not to get the vaccine. And to add insult to, industry, uh, insult to injury, they wouldn't even give them unemployment to, to be able to survive till they found another job. So you look at everything that was being done and, and it all turned out to be lies, right? The whole coronavirus, uh, there was a lot of lies perpetrated. We isolated the kids for two years. They're, they're at 
mental health crisis, but you're still not allowed to question it. They didn't acknowledge it. They didn't come out and say, hey, we were wrong. We're sorry. We'll never do it again. Instead, they double and triple down. Not only that, they're trying to rewrite history. Oh, well, we didn't. We just advised. We didn't call for these things. Right. right it's right. truly stunning. Then you look at parents, right? Parents complaining about what these kids are learning at the school boards. And you have the Department of Justice sweep in and start investigating parents as if they're some sort of domestic terrorist. You have the National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism that the Biden administration put out there, that anyone expressing any anti-government or anti-authority sentiment could be declared a domestic terrorist. Well, who gets to determine what anti-authority and anti-government is? And amazingly, it says that those that perceive the government overreaches can be violent domestic extremists. Well, who gets to determine whether the perceptions of government overreaching is if they're really overreaching? Well, it's those in power that get to determine. So we know how it plays out. So we look at all those things combined where people have legitimate grievances and yet they're being dismissed. So what do you think is going to happen when people are constantly feeling that they're, they're being targeted by the very people that have taken an oath to serve them? It's a frightening scenario. I, uh, I urge everyone to uh, to uh, read it uh, at the Federalist, uh, at, at uh, Professor uh, Nicholas Giordano, tell people where they could, if you have that on a website, and also uh, where they could hear the, uh, the um, a PAS uh, Report podcast. Sure. Everyone go to PASReport.com. They can follow me at PAS Report. I have the Federalist article linked from my website, so you can jump to the Federalist website, or you can go to the Federalist yourself. But you can just check me out at PASReport.com. I always appreciate your time. You know that. Thank you so much. Stay well. We'll talk again. Thanks, Steve. Always enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Me too. Take care. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PAS Report. 